Mark chapter 11, verses 20 through 26. Mark writes, Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up by, from the roots, and Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. And therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And so, as, as I normally do, I'll give to you a brief review into the events that are taking place that are leading up to what we're about to see, and I'll kind of build up the context for you so we can pick up on our study and uh, have an understanding of where we're going to be going today. This is the last week of the active ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so on the previous Sunday, on Palm Sunday, Jesus had entered into Jerusalem to the adoring welcome of a multitude. As he had done so, people from the city of Jerusalem had streamed out, and others who were following him from the Bethany area uh, began to join into one crowd, and as they did so, they began to, to shout out various things to him, and they were crying out very loudly their approval of, of him. They cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And so these are the things, the kinds of things that they were crying out, and they, they welcomed him with emotional cries. And as they did so, um, the Bible tells us in, in the Gospel of, uh, of Luke, that, as well as other places, that they were offended. The, the Pharisees became offended, and, and they actually called to him out of the crowd, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Luke 19, 40 says, he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And so praise was not to be withheld. This is a good moment. This is a, a holy moment. It was a, a moment that sh should have people shouting and cheering and, and crying out. And if you've ever been to Israel, those of you who have may remember that Israel is really a city that has been formed out of stones. So the point he was making is that the entire place, the inanimate, lifeless would even cry out because it's the right moment. It was a picture of how it was a, a proper thing to do. The open celebration was proper. The city should rejoice in such a way for him. Well, even though the majority were hoping for political deliverance, the welcome that they gave him was right. So as we saw, he entered into the temple. The hour was late, and so he had returned to Bethany. But the next day, on his way to Jerusalem, he had seen a fig tree. He examined it for fruit, but it was barren. It had only leaves. And so Jesus pronounced a curse on it. Verse 14 of this chapter says, in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, as we saw, he entered the city. For the second time, he cleansed the temple. It was the place that the people were to meet with and worship God, but they had profaned this holy place. And so he drove out those selling animals, he overturned the tables, and he stopped the traffic flow. But once again, the religious leaders had become angry, and, and they were so angry, but they couldn't do anything about it because they feared him. You see, the people were frustrated over the way they had been taken advantage of in the religious service, and so they were real sympathetic to Jesus and the chief priests and scribes, well, they had seen the wonderful things that he was doing. In Matthew 21, 14 and 15, it says that when Jesus went in and began to minister, the blind and the, and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. 
But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Well, after cleansing the temple and teaching and healing, Jesus left once again. He went to Bethany, but the next morning, he and his men once again returned to Jerusalem. And that's where we, we pick up our story at verse 20. Verse 20 says, In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, let me share with you just for a moment about the, the fig tree. The fig tree is a very ancient tree. It's mentioned various times in Scripture. In the Old Testament, the fig tree was used as a picture of God's blessing on his people. When, when God was describing the land of promise, he used a fig tree as an example of blessing. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy 8, verse 8, it says, It is a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. In the Old Testament, the fig tree was also used as a symbol of peace and security. In 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, it says, During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree. The first time it's referred to is found in the book of Genesis, and it was in the Garden of Eden, because after Adam and Eve had sinned, they tried to cover themselves up, and they did so with fig leaves. Genesis 3, verse 7 says, The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, when it says they knew that they were naked, their nakedness was a symbol of of their innocence, but when they sinned, they forfeited their pure consciences. They became aware of shame. They lost the purity and innocence that they once had. They were aware of their sin, and they tried to cover it up themselves. Lost purity, aware of sin, but tried to cover it up themselves. And that's what's taking place in Israel during the time of Jesus Christ. Again, the fig tree is a picture of Israel's religion, a tree filled with leaves but having no fruit. It's a religious system that gives a promise of satisfaction but is unable to fulfill that promise. You see, a fig tree can produce fruit before it sprouts leaves. That's called a bonus crop. And when Jesus found no fruit on the tree, he carefully examined it and then he cursed it. And that's what Jesus was doing to the nation of Israel, closely examining it. A nation that had the appearance of providing fruit, but in fact was not. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You can't hide your sin, in other words. God sees everything, and God saw that the nation of Israel had the appearance of being fruitful through religion, but were trying to make themselves righteous through their works. So the withering began immediately, but wasn't evident until the next morning. Now, what does the cursing of the fig tree symbolize? Well, it symbolizes national Israel, a spiritually dead nation. Israel's religion had the appearance of life, but wasn't producing fruit. And it had an impressive pretense of religion, but was spiritually dead. Many religious systems have the appearance of spiritual life. They have prayer. They have good deeds. Their adherents can be very nice, very generous, very disciplined, very sacrificial, very humble. But upon closer investigation, the system doesn't bear genuine spiritual fruit. And that's the state of Israel. It had the appearance of godliness, but no power of godliness. So the cursing of the fig tree represents what was about to occur to national Israel. Israel was about to be judged. And the cleansing of the temple symbolized this, but later Rome would fulfill it. In Mark chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, uh, Mark writes, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And so Jesus had cursed that fig tree, which symbolized the nation of Israel, and that cursing was going to be fulfilled when Rome invaded and destroyed. 
You see, outward religion without true faith is an abomination to God. In Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28, Jesus said these words, and, and I think that we need to read the whole Bible to get the whole picture, because a lot of times, especially today, there are many places where you hear of Jesus and his, his humility and his goodness and his love and his kindness and his grace, and all, but he's also righteous and he also is a judge, and many times we forget that. And he would pour out his, his indignation. He would often speak those things. He, he, he cleansed the, the temple two times, but he also spoke of the hypocrisy in Matthew 23, 27, and 28. And this is what he said when he was speaking to the religious leadership of the nation. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So you have that appearance. Well, that was the religion of Israel at that time. The Pharisees had taught them to, to strain out gnats and swallow camels. They had taught them to have religious appearance, to fast and, and to pray and to give. But, but the, the, with their mouths, they praised God, but their hearts were far from him. And Jesus spoke of that quite often. And so this this... This fig tree symbolizes the nation of Israel, a nation that is trying to make itself look righteous, a, a nation that, that has lost its innocence, a nation that's about to be judged. And so Jesus, in verse 21, well, in verse 21, it says that Peter, Peter remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. You know, he remembered just the day before that Jesus had, had cursed that tree. And to see it dried up so quickly from, from the roots to the branches, well, that's, that's amazing. That just doesn't happen. But the real question was, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? And so Jesus now gives a second lesson, and he's going to point out faith in God can do more than wither trees. Jesus is about to lay down his life. And it's important to emphasize dependence on God. As long as he had been with them, all their needs had been taken care of. But he's about to depart. And since this is true, he needs to reemphasize certain things. And so he's going to reemphasize here, he's going to reemphasize prayer. You see, in his ministry, his men had constantly seen him model service to the Father. They saw him as he taught. They would watch the way that he would speak. They, they heard the words that he spoke, and they would even mimic those things because during the time of Christ, if you were mentoring somebody, they would learn how you taught and the things that you taught. They would watch you, and they would model themselves after you. And so they watched him as he taught, and they were learning how to teach by doing so. They watched him when he would preach and the things that he would say and, and the way that he would present those kinds of things, and they listened very carefully as he, as he did so. And not only that, but they saw him as he performed miracles, and they saw him when he'd do those things, how he did those things, and all of that was part of the mentoring of Christ with his men. But the one thing that stood out in his life that all of them saw very clearly was his prayer life. They had seen from the very beginning of his ministry that he prayed regularly and fervently. Mark tells us in chapter 1, verse 35, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So they saw that the Lord would wake up early and go to a, a quiet place and would make petition and speak to the Father. In Luke 5, 16, he frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray. They saw the frequency of this. And in Luke 9, 28, it says about eight days after Jesus said these things, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. So they saw the prayer life of Christ. What's interesting is his men never asked him to teach them how to preach. They never asked Jesus, teach me how to, how, to, how, to, how to teach. They never said to Jesus, can you explain to me how I should counsel? Can you show me how I can debate? But they did ask him to teach them to do something. Luke 11 verse 1 says it like this. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. We've seen you preach. We've heard you teach. 
We've seen the miracles. We've seen the debates. We've seen you minister. We're learning those things by observing those things. But you slip away often and you speak to the Father. And, and we see that you and the Father have this rich communion. I want to have that too. Teach us how to pray. And so as they're asking for that, notice verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Hold fast to. Personally possess genuine belief, trust, and confidence in God. Have faith in God. He's not speaking about having faith in faith. He's saying have faith in God. You see, the disciples are about to go from having Jesus with them all the time to having him not with them. They needed to learn that the God who answers prayer will answer theirs. They needed to learn to trust that God would hear them. They needed to know that God would provide for them, and that requires faith in God, having confidence in God, knowing he's able to do what, he, what appears to be impossible. And it's not the greatness of our faith. It's the greatness of our God that we need to learn. In Luke 17, 5 and 6, it says, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Our faith is not in our own faith. Our faith is in our powerful God. And if our faith is placed in an all-powerful God, great things can happen. A commentary, commentator named Leon Morris said it like this. Amen. Go ahead. If you want to clap more than two or three people, that's good. <laughs> I have faith you will, but no, that's a good thought. Now, Leon Morris said, it is not necessary to have great faith. Even a small faith is enough as long as it is faith in the great God. And that's the key for us, you see. So he says it like that. And then he goes, have faith in God. For assuredly, verse 23, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. We'll look at that. Now, obviously, Jesus is speaking figuratively. He, miracles aren't performed as performance or entertainment just to attract attention. When he speaks of the mountain, that mountain speaks of something that has overwhelmed us and we feel helpless. When in this place, when we trust God, our prayer, he's saying, will be answered. You see, doubting, when he says without doubting, doubting in our heart speaks of internally arguing about God's goodness and power, his ability to do that which we're asking. Well, we're to pray without arguing within ourselves because we can argue ourselves out of trusting him. In Matthew 7, verse 7, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door will be opened to you. Ask, seek, knock, or in a in tense that means continuously. Continue asking, continue seeking, continue knocking. Hold fast, be fervent in prayer. Don't give up. James 1, 6 through 8 says, Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we hold fast. We pray. And true faith is trusting God who has revealed himself to us. And the revelation of God is found in Scripture, not in our wishes and not in testimonies of others. The revelation of God is found in Scripture, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. The apostle said, above all, you must understand no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation. For no such prophecy was ever brought forth by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't somebody's wishful thinking or invention of a God. He's saying that the Holy Spirit led men to write down his word so we would know what God wanted us to know. And when he, his commands are obeyed, he honors our obedience and that's why in verse 24, he says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Here's the internal doubt that I have. I doubt that John will be here next week. No, here's the eternal, <laughs> here's, here's the eternal doubt that I have. So recently, Marie, my wife and I went to uh, 
Washington, I was asked to do some ministry there at a uh, combined Calvary Chapel pastors and church conference. And so I went to the church conference to teach um, these, these men and all. And so we go to the airport here in Ontario and we're going through the um, x-ray and all of that and, that. and so I put my bags on that little the conveyor belt and I forgot that I had my my phone in my pocket. In my phone, I have a, all my information that I carry like you, but I also have a lot of pictures of my grandchildren and my family that are dear to me. And yes, they're in the cloud, I know that, but they're dear to me anyway. It's just for some reason, I've been taking pictures of my babies since they were first born. I have pictures of my, my grandchildren, some of them when they were just born. I, and those are very dear to me. I'm, some people know this about me, I'm very sentimental. And uh, those things matter to me. And so I forgot to take my phone out of my pocket. So I, I tapped my pocket. Oh, and so I, my bag was already on the belt and everything. You know, I'd already put it. So I put my phone in one of those little bowls, containers. And I went through and picked up my bag and picked up my knapsack and the whole nine yards. Uh, and uh, I left and went to, to uh, sit down, Marie and I. And so as we're seated there, I tapped my, my pocket because I was going to check on some emails and I didn't have it. I said, oh no, I forgot it. So I went back to you know, the place of inspection and I spoke to a couple of the, the people there and one lady was so very kind. She helped me look everywhere for it. She looked in the lost and found to see whether it was turned in and all. Well, by that time I'm thinking, no, this is, no, I, I've lost it. I've lost my phone. Now I'm angry. Because I get, I get angry about some things, and that's one of the things that made me angry. I thought, oh, man, somebody stole my phone. Now I'm mad at whoever it is, that invisible person who stole my phone. <laughs> so, and I don't know about you. I don't know how you handled your temper or not. Me, I have to go off by myself and broke some windows and stole some stuff. It, but, that, it, <laughs> but it was a righteous anger. No, I, so, no, nah, so I, I went and I just, I, I was, and I was, I was really letting the Lord know how I felt about this. You know, God, somebody stole my phone. Marie's saying, honey, somebody may turn it in. Please get behind me. <laughs> you don't know human nature. Human nature is evil. And I have taught you that it's evil. They're thieves. They're thieves. They're a thief. And I went on and told Jesus about the thief. And I was very angry. And I'm just, oh. so I go up to Marie and I say, can I have your phone? Let me call myself, see if I can hear it, because it may be around here. So I, I dial, but the music is so loud, I can't hear it. Now that's only aggravating me more. <laughs> so I give her the phone, and I guess I'm just, I'm just beside myself at this point. I'm so angry. Yes, I know it's a phone, and I know you're more spiritual than me, and you wouldn't have gotten mad, but this is my <laughs> confession, so let me get it out. So anyway. Marie says to me, baby, I'm praying for you. I said, okay, that's fine. You want to pray? But some, some thief's got my pictures. I went and I stood by myself because I have to calm down. I'm that frustrated. Oh, my. So anyway, we go to the, to the desk to uh, get our seat and everything, and, and Marie lost her boarding pass. So I get her a boarding pass. All of this is taking place, and I'm standing there, and I get a phone call from my daughter, Anna, and Anna leaves a message on Marie's phone, not on mine, because I don't have it. Um, <laughs> we're praying for you. I'm praying for you, because I had called. I said, you're going to have to turn off my phone service. So here comes one of the people from the place where you check your baggage and they do all the examine, two of them. And they walk up and said, sir. Um, and I said, hello. And they walk past me to a guy and his wife who's standing six feet, 10 feet from me, as close as these rails are to me. It's right there. Sir, may I look in your bag? They say to this guy. And the guy goes, sure, of course. And he opens up the bag, pulls out a phone. He says to me, is this your phone? And I said, yeah, it is. So I went and popped that guy. In no, I said, you thief, you thief, you thief. No, I went, 
a pox on your house. But I went, and he says, I'm so sorry. He says, my wife has a phone that looks, he said, I thought, now his wife was in a wheelchair, you know. I mean, my heart was, you know, immediately God said, you idiot, you know. I'm, and so there, it's handed back to me. And so I'm thinking, well, thank you. He says, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. He said, I thought that was my wife's. We, 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 and I said, you know what? I get it. I thank you. My daughter and Marie had been praying at the same time. And I read. Now I look at my phone, and my phone and my daughter writes and says, Daddy, I'm praying for you. Marie was praying for me. And I thought, Lord, this is just like you. No faith. See, so I, I don't want to come on here and say, uh, you don't have faith. Let me tell you what faith is. No, I don't. I fight and I struggle too. I mean, my, what I see, uh, you know, I see a lot of people still in line. That, that's what I see. That's what ministers see. And that's just my, that's just John. I mean, the rest, the, no. No, I see, I see a lot. I still, I see that. And so it can make you actually begin to doubt the goodness of God versus the evil of man. I'm telling you, it's very easy. It's very real with me. And the funny thing about all this is when I got on the plane, I was walking past the fellow who was seated already. He says, he said, because I told him, I said, you know what? You know, my God had already dealt with my, my frustration. I was already okay by that time. But he said, he, I had said, you know, I'm a pastor. I said, I have a lot of things in my phone and it matters to me. I said, and, but the most important thing is it has my pictures of my children. And that matters to me. And I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry I show emotion, but that's the depth of it. That I really do. That's what matters to me. But he says, you're a pastor. He said, yes. I said, he goes, what church do you pastor? And I told him, and he says, I've been to your church. I've been to your church. I said, you lying thief. No, I said, I said, well, he may be here right now. I'm just kidding. But, but he says, I know who you are. I've been to your church. And I said, well, praise the Lord. Well, why did I tell you that? It's because sometimes the things that are going on around you are so loud, you can't hear the small voice of the Lord who says, have faith in me. I, I suffer with that, too. I don't stand up here as somebody who doesn't. I, I'm I'm part of us. I mean, I, I go through these things. And so I have to trust the Lord, even in what people would say, that's a very small thing. And indeed it is. But to some, somebody, something small, somebody else, it's, it's great. It's, 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 it's what God is doing in you. And, and we trust the Lord. We, we trust that God answers prayer and all. And, and so we, we, we lift our petitions to the Lord and we ask God to be involved in, and we, and we, you know, we, we take these concerns in, that we have to the Lord in prayer. I remember one of my assistants at the time had been called to go to the hospital for a visitation. One of our ladies was, was ill, and she had, they had a, an air tube, but she was, her lungs weren't doing very well. And so he was greatly concerned, and he came back and said, well, that was interesting. I went and prayed, and I said, really? He says, you know what happened? I said, what? He says, I, I went in, and and I, I said to her, may I pray for you? And she said, oh, of course, please do. He says, Pastor, he says, as I was praying for her, she started grabbing her face, her mask. And she started, he said, oh, my Lord, she's, she's going to die right in front of me. God, what am I going to do? He says, as she's grabbing her, 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 her mask because she can't breathe, he said, I looked down and I was standing on her air hose. <laughs> So you never want to ask him to come and pray for you. So anyway, getting back to our Bible study. <laughs> Whatever th things you ask when you pray, believe that you, have, that you receive them and you will have them. Obviously, to answer or to receive an answer to prayer requires us to ask James chapter 4, verse 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. But he says, believe. Believe that you receive them and you will have them. Again, I, I tried to learn this very early in my, in my spiritual life. In John chapter 14, verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, 
he said, Jesus, I will do it. When he says, if you ask anything in my name, it's not like that's some magic formula. If you ask anything in my name, the words my name speaks of his authority. You know, it's like when somebody says stop in the name of the law, the law. It's not the police officer whose authority is being invoked. It's the law that's being invoked in my name speaks of the authority of Christ. And so he's saying, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But Jesus in John 16, 24 said, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Up to this point, you have asked nothing in my name by my authority. Ask, and you shall receive. Ask, it will be given to you. And so we go before the Lord in the name and authority of Christ who made it possible for us to go to God because it was through Christ that the blood of his offering that has cleansed us from sin and made it possible for us to stand in the throne room of God and to speak to him and say, God, I need your help. And when we come to him, we come in faith, believing that he hears us and, and, and we trust that he will answer requests that we are making. But the qualifier is that we do not pray with wrong motives, praying outside of the will of God. You may be praying for somebody that you'd like to date, but that person's not saved. Instead of praying, I'd like to go out with this person, you ought to be praying, you should which would be in the will of God, for it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we say, Lord, in Jesus' name, you know I'm attracted to this person, but this person isn't saved. And I want to put my desires aside, and I'm going to ask you, if you touch them, that they might be saved. You see, in 1 John 5, 14, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So how do I know the will of the Father? I know the will of the Father by thoroughly reading the word of God because he discloses to us what his will is. Now notice in verse 25, he goes on and he says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So Jesus says in verse 25, when you stand praying, which is the normal way of prayer during the day of Christ. They would stand and they would pray. Of course, there's no scriptural standard for a physical posture of prayer. You can stand, you can kneel, you can be seated, you can lay your face on the, on the ground before the Lord. The true posture is one of the heart, and that's what Jesus would emphasize. But he says this in verse 25. He says, he says, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. That's an important point in this. Forgive him. Now he spoke about faith. Jesus spoke about faith. Now he speaks about sins. Sins that separate. Sin will always make a separation. Sin makes a separation between God and ourselves. My sin makes a separation so that he will not hear me. But it also separates me from my brother or my sister in the Lord. It can separate me from people in general. So he says, if you have something, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive. That word forgive in the original language, in the Greek language, means to send away. It means to let go or to release. It means to allow, to depart. That's what forgiving is. It's a send away to allow, to depart, to release. It can be used in reference to somebody who owes me something and I forgive him his debt. That's why we forgive those who have sinned against us because Jesus, when he taught us to pray, made it, made it very clear that we release them from the debt that they owe us. And that's what forgiveness is. So Jesus says, if you have anything against anyone, notice forgive him. Now, it's interesting how he links relationships among people with answered prayer. In order for his men to reach the world with the gospel, forgiveness and unity would be needed. And this applies to them. It applies not only to them, but it applies to all of us. You see, his apostles, remember, had an ongoing argument concerning the greatness in the kingdom. In Mark 9, 34, it reveals that his men had, had disputed amongst themselves who would be greatest. In Mark 10, 37, well, that verse tells us that James and John had requested to, to be seated at his right hand and left in his glory. Even in the night that Christ was betrayed and he established 
the first communion service, he had spoken of yielding up his body and his blood, making a new covenant. He went on to speak concerning a betrayer who was there even at the very table. He had said that he was going the way it was determined, but woe to the man who betrayed him. And in all of that, Jesus is speaking and, and he's sharing these things as he's, he's giving them a new, a new covenant and all. And, and then Luke records uh, that after he had said this, an argument had broken out. In Luke 22, at verse 24, it says, there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Even in the midst of all of that, he was teaching them, establishing communion. He told them the betrayer is there at the table. He's going the way that he is appointed to go. This should have made them very sober-minded. But Luke says, no, they were still arguing. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? This constant drive for greatness was one of the most dangerous attitudes they could have. It was a desire that was rooted in selfish ambition, and that would undermine the message of the gospel. They needed to understand the priority of dying to self and self-seeking. They needed to work together as a team. And when his men argued over positions, they were in danger of causing angry feelings. That's what happened when James and John had asked for special positions because Mark says, when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. So this kind of attitude would hinder and undermine the preaching of the message of the gospel. The men needed to act as a team. They needed to learn to work together for the greater good. But unforgiveness amongst them would cause separation of fellowship. And when they were divided, they would no longer be concentrated on ministry and reaching the lost and their unity would have been one of the ways to demonstrate that they actually knew God. In John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus said it like this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's how the world's going to know. That we love one another, that there's something here in the body of Christ that matters, and forgiveness does. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul used the image of the church being the body of Christ, and he made it clear that each part has individual duties, but each part is necessary. He made it clear that each part of the body needs the other parts. Do you know that if you have an injury, as, as I told you last week, I, I, I fell and, uh, and uh, hurt my leg and all, and you never realize how the whole body connects until you hurt one part of it. Then you realize that, boy, it's all connected. It's all interconnected. You may think, well, your toe doesn't matter. But when you get up at night and it's cold and you hit your toe on, that, on, on something, on the bed or whatever, you, does your whole body just go, ha, ah, too bad, little toe? No, the whole body just reacts in a spasm. Wow, your whole body does everything. Why? Because one little toe matters. And in the body of Christ, each part of the body matters. I don't know how to put this more clearly than that. When we work well together and love one another and forgive each other of the offenses that we have committed, and indeed we do, it's a testimony to the world. It's a testimony to the world. You know, sometimes churches are almost like professional church hoppers. They go from one place to another, one place to another, looking for the perfect place. Because something happens here they didn't like, or something happened there that they didn't like. And, and so they take their anger with them, and they just project it on every place they go. They always find something wrong with somebody else. And they don't realize that we have to have grace towards one another. In 1 Corinthians 12, 25, Paul said that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. We ought to take care of each other. One part depends on the other. And when one is injured, the rest are affected. And unforgiveness affects other parts of the body and quenches the Holy Spirit. When, when we hold angry grudges, it disrupts our fellowship with the person that we're angry with. It also disrupts our fellowship with God. It hinders our prayer life and it can cause a division. You see, effective prayer always presupposes a forgiving heart. This is because when you've been forgiven, humility makes it easier to forgive others. Who am I to point a finger at you when I myself have done similar things? 
And we're, when we're born again, we know that we're sinners saved by the grace of God. And, and because we know who we are and what we've been, we ought to have sensitivity to other people. And that knowledge should produce humility as well as encourage a heart of charity. In Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And I went to a, a pastor friend of mine one time. I was going through a struggle, and as a young Christian at the time, a couple of years old, three years old in the Lord or so, and I was struggling with anger and all. And, and I went and spoke to the pastor, and I said to him, I'm, I'm upset and and he said to me, well, you know, and he quoted Ephesians 4.32, forgiving one another, even as Christ for God's sake, God for Christ's sake forgave you. And he said, you know, David, you're, you're supposed to forgive. I said, uh, yeah, and he says, even as God forgave you. And I was so angry and bitter. I said to him, sure, he forgives. That's his job. And he looked at me. Because that was such an angry thing and something he didn't expect to come out of my mouth. But that's how bitter I was. I wasn't going to let go. I wasn't going to. I was so angry. I wasn't going to let go. I'm so angry. You need to forgive. No. And then I spoke the same thing to another friend of mine who was one of my professors at Biola when I was there as a young student. And he said, David, you need to forgive. And I said, why? He said, because God wants to use you. And what you're going through. It's something you'll hear other people have gone through. And if you don't overcome this in Christ, you'll never help somebody to overcome it. You need to let it go. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I would not let go. And as a result of that, for some time, I began to spiritually wither inside. Unforgiveness actually puts you in a bondage. It, it, it brings you into slavery you become a, a slave to that anger and and it took it took a while and what set me free was the word of god the word of god as i as i read it began to 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 cleanse my evil heart and 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 taught me that that i i am to forgive and and that it wasn't just me that was sinned against but there were others especially god and when i began to to realize that I let it go. You have to. You see, when, when you forgive, it actually sets two people free. It, it sets free that person who has sinned against you, but it also sets you free. There's that way it set me free. And forgiving makes it possible for us to live and to live in unity. And it makes our prayer life even richer. He said in verse 26, but if you don't forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. When he speaks of trespasses, a trespass has been translated as a misstep in your walk with God. If you've been forgiven, then, then you're going to become humble and compassionate towards other people. And that's the fruit associated with appropriating forgiveness for ourselves. If you desire your prayer to be answered, they need to be offered in faith as well as love. And if you expect fellowship with God, you must also secure fellowship with people. To forgive another for sinning against you makes fellowship with God possible. Holding anger against someone quenches the spirit and quenches the work of God. And if we are unforgiving and unrepentant, if we refuse to let go, our prayers are hindered. Psalm 66, 18 says it like this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So on the part of a believer, when we refuse to let go, we stifle our walk with God and to hold a grudge reveals a heart that's not fully aware of the measure of grace. Every believer must seek to have a forgiving spirit and to refuse to forgive others is to invite judgment on yourself. James 2.13 says, Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. By remembering God's gracious forgiveness for us, we can pray with confidence. In Psalm 4, verse 3, Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Sometimes we carry bitterness and it stifles the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Sometimes we become debt collectors. We think that person owes us when in fact it wasn't really only against us that we were offended or hurt. It was he offended, she offended God himself. And if God forgave, how much more so should we? I remember I was angry one time at somebody and I just, I was just so bitter towards them. And they said, David, they said, God forgave me. Why can't you? And that caused me some very deep soul searching. They were right. If God forgave them, why can't I? Sometimes a wounded spirit is hard to heal. But when you yield to the spirit of the Lord and say, God, I just want to be in a right position for you. Work in me. And so in prayer, you have faith. And you have love. And when you have faith in God and love for him and others, you can take your petition before the throne of God and you can say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. But I'm asking that you would answer this prayer. And our God is able. Very often he does. And sometimes he may not answer you exactly like you'd want him to. I prayed for a long time that God would give me a young woman for my wife. I prayed for several years for this one particular young woman. And God said, no, that one's not for you. And then he gave me the one that I couldn't live without. He gave me my Marie. All these years, as a young man, I had prayed for somebody. Oh, God, please, I want. And then one day the Lord very, very graciously and kindly said to me, that one is not for you. This one is. This one is. And I have never regretted from Dave, Marie, and I became one in our love. I have never regretted that I didn't have the other. Thank God. The other went to somebody that she was prepared for, but God prepared this one for me. And so I learned a long time ago to listen for the Lord to answer in the way he wants, but to make sure that my prayers are according to his will and that I learn to forgive those who have hurt me and that I trust him that he will answer. And he does. All of us can say how good God has been in that way. God has been good to us. He does answer our prayers. And I thank him every day for that. Our Father, we ask that you would work in us today.